until a life-changing event. I was a selfish, climate change denying, profit-focused investment manager who loved fishing and the environment, but didn't want to accept why I was catching less fish. The ocean has always been a massive part of my life. You see, I grew up in Aubrey, a small English town next to the North Sea in Suffolk. In fact, our house was so close to the water, I would fall asleep with the sound of the waves washing over the stony beach. I remember magical mornings fishing with my grandfather, watching the sun come up, excited that the rod would bend with a sea bass taking our bait. Those early childhood memories have influenced how I live my life. My family, my home, and my businesses all center around the ocean. And the excitement and anticipation of catching fish is as strong today as it was when I was a little boy. I have spent hundreds of days fishing. And by being on the water, I could see the dramatic change in sea surface temperatures especially in the waters surrounding my home in the British Virgin Islands. The fishing season is now much shorter and the once thriving year-round bait fish are almost gone. Even though it was happening right before my eyes, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't put two and two together that what was happening in the Caribbean Sea was the result of climate change. That was until 2017, when Hurricane Irma, a Category 5 storm, destroyed 4,000 homes in the BVI, including my own, and sadly led to the death of my great fishing friend, Zeph. It took over a year to restore basic services like water and electricity to the BVI, and much of the damage to the island can still be seen today. It was then that I learned hurricanes are nature's way of cooling sea surface temperatures. So as carbon emissions continue to warm up the earth, the oceans absorb the heat and hurricanes become much stronger and more frequent. It was Hurricane Irma and the devastation it brought that woke me up to the fact that climate change was real and I could no longer deny it. The more I looked into climate change, the more I learned about the power of the ocean. I learned that the ocean generates 50% of the oxygen we need, captures 25% of all carbon dioxide emissions, and absorbs 90% of the excess heat generated by those emissions. I also learned that if we restore our ocean's health, there may be hope for our planet. But, but what could I do about it? It's an enormous, almost paralyzing task for an individual to attempt to tackle. Governments, corporations, scientists, and fellow entrepreneurs must work together to reverse the negative impact of industrialization. As for the corporate sector, despite continued pressure on companies to meet net zero, most business leaders can't possibly do so and still achieve their primary goal, maximizing profits for shareholders. The higher cost of producing climate-friendly products and services almost compels companies to cut corners and in my opinion, promotes bad practice. And we all know greenwashing does nothing to reduce ocean temperatures. We need commercial solutions for business to lower their emissions. If we can show that they can inset carbon removal into their daily operations and not just offset through carbon credits, we can make net zero attractive. It would be amazing if businesses could invest in nature-based solutions that don't just slow the effects of climate change, but actually reverse them. Because despite what some would tell us, we don't need to build multi-billion dollar 
carbon sequestration factories to remove carbon dioxide or gigafactories to produce oxygen? Because nature already does it. The ocean has everything we need. We have oysters, mangroves, seagrass, phytoplankton and kelp which are natural sequesters of carbon and actually generate oxygen. Kelp forests are not just one of the plant's leading source of carbon sequestration, they are breeding grounds for over 800 species of marine organisms. In countries like Norway, the USA, New Zealand, Australia and Japan, kelp forests on their coastlines are disappearing four times faster than rainforests on land. I wanted to know why, and I discovered sea urchins are eating it all. A decline in their predators due to warmer oceans, overfishing, acidification, has meant that the urchin population has exploded. So the urchins eat the kelp, and if nothing eats the urchins, they will continue to eat the kelp until the kelp has all gone. And unlike most sea creatures, they can sit dormant for decades. When the kelp tries to regrow, they burst into life, shuffle across and gobble it all up. Urchins have decimated over 90% of kelp on the California coastline, creating huge dead zones, or ocean barrens as they are known. The magnitude of the problem makes the restoration of kelp in our coastal waters too big and too expensive. And the more I looked into it, the more hopeless it felt. And then I learned about profitable, holistic, nature-based solutions which restore natural balance and combat climate change. A great example is urchinomics, where commercial divers and fishermen are paid to remove urchins. Then on-land aquaculture facilities are paid to nurture them. And the roe, or uni, as it's known, is then sold into the multi-billion dollar sushi market to finance it all. With the urchins out of the way, the kelp regrows up to 30 centimeters per day. Urchinomics is a UN-endorsed, self-sustaining aquaculture business that restores our much-needed kelp forests. But as a passionate fisherman, I instinctively didn't like aquaculture or fish farming. But urchinomics isn't just fish farming, it's restorative aquaculture in action. Then there's the example of the European flat oyster, an essential building block of our coastal ecosystems. Just like kelp, human activity has destroyed the once abundant populations of native oysters to a level that makes natural regeneration impossible. I love eating oysters. I thought they were grown all over Europe. But the truth is, most oysters grown for food are Pacific oysters, and they aren't native to Europe. Native oysters are more effective than trees in capturing and storing carbon emissions. A single oyster filters particulates and contaminants, including nitrates, from up to 240 litres of seawater per day. These essential natural building blocks from marine ecosystems allow biodiversity to thrive. I just couldn't understand why there wasn't already a native oyster breeding program restocking European coastal waters. So I talked to scientists and they explained it's an extremely complex process and without grants or government support, it just wasn't possible. Motivated to save the species, I brought together a team of marine biologists and built a facility on land containing a protective arc of adult breeding oysters 
to prevent the species spiraling into an extinction vortex. The next step was to index the genetics to create a broodstock library which would become the keystone of future generations. We then built a hatchery capable of producing one billion oysters over the next 10 years. From 2024, the Oyster Restoration Company will produce enough oysters to restore up to 100 kilometers of coastline per year. And Urchinomics has proven that for each hectare of urchin barrens removed, the kelp will go on to sequester one tonne of carbon per year. Imagine if this was happening all over the world. We could literally eat our way to healthier oceans. Holistic, restorative aquaculture creates jobs, produces food, repopulates wild stock, restores natural balance, and removes carbon dioxide. Working with coastal communities can help ensure that First Nation fishermen will have an equitable stake in the future. By addressing so many significant issues at once, following a restorative ocean-first model like Urchinomics, the Oyster Restoration Company, and the other nature-based solutions around the world, it's hard not to feel hope rather than fear and despair. I now know that we are at a critical stage where we have depleted our kelp forests, our seagrass, our oysters, and our mangroves to a point where nature can no longer cope. 2023 was the hottest year on record, affecting millions of animals and people. The intensity of flooding, drought, hurricanes, and wildfires are all at record levels. Let's stop making excuses and denying that the earth is warming due to human activity or believing it's someone else's problem to solve. Now is the time for the world leaders who stand on stages and promise net zero to engage with the change makers and together we can actually do something about it. After Hurricane Irma, I did what many of us do during a hard time in our lives. I asked my father for advice about what I should do to end the devastation of climate change. My very pragmatic, witty father said, nobody will try to save the planet until they can make money from doing it. And then, in that moment, in late 2017, it all came together. I realized that as a fisherman, I understand the ocean. As a pragmatic environmentalist, I understand balance. As an investment banker, I have access to capital. And as a business owner, I knew the importance of profitable operations. So I stepped aside as CEO of my company and made the decision to dedicate my life to pioneering and supporting profitable nature-based solutions to reverse climate change. Perhaps that was the day I became an ecopreneur. Back then, I didn't even know there was such a thing. I have been inspired watching ecopreneurs around the world bring together conservationists, fishermen, agriculturalists, and investors. It's now time for politicians and legislators to join us. We desperately need them to fast track approval for licenses and permits to build infrastructure for restorative nature-based solutions. Because we know we cannot stop 
our way to a solution. We cannot conserve our way to a solution. We can't even tax our way to a solution because it's not only about reducing our current carbon emissions, it's about removing the pollution we have emitted over the past 200 years. I have given two examples of self-sustaining, profitable, nature-based solutions to climate change. There are many, many more that need our help. And if we restore the biodiversity of our coastal ecosystems, we will regenerate our oceans and give nature the helping hand it needs to cool our planet. As I moved from denier to believer to change maker, I now know that by restoring our oceans health, there is hope for our planet.